Namaste. So just taking up right where we left off last time, it, Brahman, has been more particularly declared as being by nature constant intelligence. So we didn't really cover that, you know, the end of that clause. Intelligence means discrimination. This is this, that is that. <laughs> Being able to tell two things apart. And, of course, the more keen and sharp a person's intelligence is, the more they can distinguish between two very similar things. So this subtle intelligence is there in an unlimited amount in Brahman. Brahman is unconditioned, pure, unary. It's not two. That's what Advaita means, not two. That means there are no divisions, no boundaries, no limits, no differences, no change. What to speak of birth and death. <laughs> There's no change at all in Brahman. Brahman is beginningless, endless, does not come into being. It simply is. And the isness or beingness of everything else is derived from Brahman alone. So this is the amazing transcendental quality of Brahman. That even though everything comes from Brahman, it's not exactly emanated by Brahman, but it springs spontaneously into being. Brahman is almost like a catalyst. In a chemical reaction, a catalyst is a substance that has to be present for the reaction to take place. But it is not directly involved in the reaction, nor is it consumed in the reaction. So Brahman is the same way. Even though it's not directly involved in the material creation, the material creation wouldn't happen without it. And more than that, even though, of course, we can see this extensive universe going out to infinity in all directions, that material is not derived from Brahman. It doesn't use up Brahman. <laughs> Brahman remains full and complete. Aum Purnamidam Purnamada Purnat Purnam Udachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vasisyate Even though so many complete units such as the material worlds and the creatures therein, and so forth, emanate from the complete Brahman, huh? that remains complete and full without any diminution. So this is a, a paradox. This is a brain twister. This kind of thing requires extreme intelligence to understand. And so the Kevala Dvaita philosophy of Shankaracharya and his predecessors is really the only theory that fits the facts and is verifiable by anyone without any extraneous equipment or even extraneous ideas. Once you understand that Brahman exists and is the self, yourself, myself, the self of every living creature, even of non-moving things like rocks and stones, then you can understand that these various states of consciousness that we experience are all simply reflections of Brahman. Brahman is the unlimited source of the most fine intelligence. 
And the intelligence that we experience in the various states of consciousness is only a dim reflection of that. It isn't the original. Can't be. Because in all the three states of conditioned consciousness, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, there is discrimination. And this discrimination fundamentally discriminates between self and not self. And so we can take, basically in, in any state of consciousness, we can take anything that's perceived and identify that as not self. Because the self is the perceiver, the witness in all situations. Even though in this world, the conditions are changing constantly. The one thing that remains the same in all conditions, all states of consciousness and so on, is consciousness. Or more particularly, the unconditioned awareness at the root of consciousness, the substrate for all the states of consciousness. Because consciousness requires an object. That means it's dualistic. There's a distinction, a difference between the subject, the knower, and the object, the known. And then there's also the act of knowing. But in Brahman, there is no action. There is no subject-object dichotomy. There is no distinction, no boundaries, none of that. So there cannot be consciousness in Brahman. Secondly, one cannot be conscious of Brahman. Nevertheless, in the state of Turiya consciousness, there is awareness of awareness. We are aware that we're aware. Now, usually we put this in terms of being conscious of an object. But if you look into it carefully, I mean, investigate it within your own experience, you will find that the object is not required. You can actually detach awareness, pure awareness, from all objects. And this is what happens in the process of Raja Yoga by means of the process of neti neti. Neti means not this. Neti neti means not this, not this, not this, not this. Indefinitely repeated. And what is this? Remember, in the Upanishads, this stands for the world, the creation, phenomena, that which is perceivable, that which is knowable. And that stands for Brahman, the imperceivable, the unknowable, the self. So we can never see the self. We can only be the self, as Ramana Maharshi said, because Brahman is never the object. It's never the effect of any process, even a process of knowing, a process of discernment, a process of discrimination, of intelligence, of consciousness even. It's never the object of anything because it is unary, non-dual. And to be an object, you have to have a subject, and that means duality. So if you think it through, you realize that you can never be directly conscious of Brahman. We can only be indirectly conscious of its effects, or at least the effects in the material world that are related to it, which is everything. <laughs> the point is here, by the process of neti neti, we eventually reach the void, shunyata, that where there is no objects. At that point, one is in a position to know the subject, the knower, 
And one cannot know the knower as an object. One can only know it as one's self. The core or origin of all awareness. So this is the nature of Brahman. It's very paradoxical, very strange, only because we are used to the idea, living in the dualistic world of conditioned consciousness, that everything is an object. <laughs> but if Brahman could become an object, that would lead to an infinite regress. Because if Brahman can be known, or if Brahman is created by something else, or if Brahman can be uh, perceived by something else, that means there is something else that's fundamental, that's causeless, that's without origin. You see? It's just like if you say, well, God created everything. Well, then who created God? And you can go back, 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 you know, oh, it was the Big Bang. Oh, what came before the Big Bang? Who lit the fuse on the Big Bang? <laughs> so science is finding out more and more now. Physicists are saying that the universe is an illusion. Sometimes it's called a simulation. But it's only called a simulation because it's believed to be not real, unreal. But they're still hung up on Jagrat consciousness, thinking that there's another level of reality that is real, that can be an object. But no, nothing that can be an object can be real because it has a beginning and an end. Because it's part of duality. And everything in duality is unreal. This is how the whole massive creation comes out or appears to come out of Brahman without Brahman being reduced or diminished in any way. The fact that the universe is an illusion. That means it's composed of upadis. Upadis are projections, actually projections of ignorance. Ignorance means sushupti consciousness. So upadis composed of sushupti consciousness limit Brahman and condition Brahman to appear to be so many things, so many objects and processes and energies and so on and so forth, whatever you can perceive in the material world. Brahman is imperceivable because Brahman is the perceiver in all conditions, in all circumstances. But Brahman appears to become all this. Huh? Just like it says right in the beginning of the Mandukya Upanishad, Aum is all this. And this Brahman is Aum. Aum is the symbol that represents all the creations of Brahman and Brahman itself, the whole, everything, whatever there is, whatever can be, whatever even cannot be known, but still exists, is also Aum. So the Upanishads use this symbol, Aum, to denote not only Brahman, but the creation that springs up around it somehow or other. <laughs> and this chapter is going to explain this mechanism in great detail. How, by means of sushupti consciousness, that various parts or qualities or aspects or attributes of Brahman are denied and others are allowed to stand. Sushupti covers Brahman and leaving only narrow windows into Brahman and by that means creates all the phenomena in the material world up to and including consciousness itself. So all this is an illusion based on ignorance. Huh? It's an imagination. 
All this, this whole material creation, is nothing but shadows, darkness, obscuring the light of Brahman. And what is that light? Pure intelligence. Because Brahman is potentially everything. Any diminution of its qualities shows up as darkness, whereas Brahman itself shows up as light, but not ordinary light. The light of Brahman is existence, consciousness, and bliss. So this existence, consciousness, and bliss is everything. And these qualities are all derived from Brahman and reflected by the various objects in the material world. So the body appears to be conscious. The mind appears to be conscious. The intellect appears to be conscious. But all these things are actually just machines. <laughs> machines are never conscious. They can only reflect the consciousness or the awareness of Brahman. And since they are part of duality, they split this consciousness into subject and object. And so the apparency of the material world is a series of illusions. Like he goes on to say, it, Brahman, suffers transmigration owing to adventitious limiting adjuncts, as, for instance, the appearance of a rope, a desert, a mother of pearl, and the sky, as a snake, water, silver, and blue, respectively, is due to the superimposition of foreign elements, not intrinsically. So here he discusses the nature of upadis. Adventitious means by luck or by chance. And we have to recognize that in this material world, so much of what we call reality is simply adventitious. Huh? It's by luck, by chance. There is no plan, no pattern, no set laws governing it. It's contingent. Contingent means dependent on its creating circumstances, the factors that bring it into being. And really, those could be anything. And that describes our own self, our material self with a small s, uh, the empirical self, as it's called, and all the phenomena and qualities that are related to it and are perceived through the mind and senses. So this adventitious, contingent, limiting adjunct, huh? an adjunct is something that is paired with or belongs to a certain thing, but is not intrinsically part of it. So he makes some examples here. The rope seems to be a snake under certain conditions. The desert seems to have water in it. Again, under certain conditions, when the light of the sun is refracted just right. Silver appears in mother of pearl, the lining of a, a seashell. Looks like silver, but it's not silver. And blue appears to be the sky. But the sky isn't blue, the sky is colorless. The blue color comes from scattering of the sun's rays by tiny particles. Uh, we all learned this in science class at some point. The sky isn't really blue. It just appears that way because of certain conditions. And similarly with the rope and snake, the desert and the water and so on. So in the same way, this material world appears to exist it appears to be real, but it can't be real because it's temporary. Therefore, we have to infer the existence of another reality, which is the actual reality behind this. 
And that reality being unconditioned is also imperceivable. Therefore, Brahman can be known only indirectly through inference. So he continues, but devoid of the limiting adjuncts, it, meaning Brahman, is indefinable to be described only as not this, not this. And the Brahman that is immediate and direct, the self that is within all, the immutable, the internal ruler, the mighty ruler, the being who is to be known only through the Upanishads, knowledge, bliss, and Brahman. That same Brahman, which is immediate and within all, has again been taught by the mention of some particular ways of attaining it. So this Brahman cannot be known directly, but it can be known through certain ways which are given in the Upanishads. In fact, the whole clue given by the Upanishads, I mean, the major clue is that Brahman even exists because without being told, you would never guess. The eye cannot see itself. Similarly, the self cannot know itself because that would mean it was dualistic and the self is non-dual. So it can't know itself and it can't be known by consciousness. How can we know it? We can know it by its effects. We can know it by its symptoms. For example, awareness of awareness. We all know that we are aware. We are aware that we're aware. But what is the mechanism behind that? Nobody, <laughs> nobody can even begin to explain it. It's so mysterious because Brahman is non-dual. There's nothing you can say about it. After he spends 22 minutes talking about Brahman, there's nothing you can say about it. He who is called Indha, Vaishvanara, takes fine food. Beyond it, in the heart, is the self identified with the subtle body, which takes finer food. Higher still is the self identified with the universe, which has the vital force for its limiting adjunct, that is, the pragna. This is a quote from Brihadaranyakopanishad 4.2. Now, if we go back and look at that, we can see that actually he's talking about the three states of conditioned consciousness. In Jagrat, Vaishvanara, which remember back in Mandukyopanishad, we talked about Jagrat consciousness as a collective being called Vaishvanara or Hiranyagarbha, the collection of all the human false egos and consciousness in the universe. Oh boy, that's Brahma, Lord Brahma. Beyond it, in the heart, is the self identified with the subtle body. Well, that's Svapna, dream consciousness. Dreaming and thinking are the same thing. Language is also dreaming because it's symbolic. Reason is dreaming. These are specific kinds of dreaming that we have become very dependent on for our human existence. Religion, meditation, spiritual life, I mean, so many things are actually dreams, svapna. That doesn't mean they are not important. They are absolutely important because this state is actually the source of everything that we call human. Intelligence, creativity, so many things that come from language, mathematics, I mean science, everything that involves ratiocination is basically Svapna consciousness. And then finally, higher still is the self identified with the universe, which has the vital force, prana, 
for its limiting adjunct, that is sushupti. That's why we've been saying again and again, <laughs> nobody seems to really get it, that sushupti is the creative force behind everything. If you master sushupti consciousness, there's nothing that you can't do. It's so powerful. You can create worlds, literally, through sushupti. And we do. When we go from one world to another, from one loka to another, these places are real within the lower states of consciousness, especially jagra. So when we go, let's say, for example, to a heavenly planet after death of this body, then we're in a subtle body. And the laws of nature that apply to the subtle body are very different than the gross body. We can fly, for example. We can change shape. We can have so many attributes, qualities, powers, activities, and so on, intelligence included, that we cannot have in this world, which is driven by Jagrat consciousness, because Jagrat applies to gross things. But when we're talking about Svapna, which is the subtle mind, the scope of our breadth of knowledge and activities becomes unimaginably vast. That's why all the gods stay in Svapna, they don't come down to this world. They don't come to where they have a visible form in Jagrat consciousness. That's why in the old days, when there would be a Vedic sacrifice, the soma drink, the psychedelic herbal soma, would be prepared, offered to the fire and to the gods. And then everyone would drink it. And then the various gods would be invoked by mantras and the people could see them. Why? Because their subtle vision was awakened. That's the actual nature of the gods. You could say they're dreams. More, more accurately, they're powerful thought forms. And one can see them in the right state of consciousness. So all these states of consciousness are different when, when they're collated or concentrated are very powerful entities. Brahma creates this universe, basically dreams it into existence by the mode of passion. Vishnu pervades everything because his Shakti, his power, is the combined material elements of the whole creation. And Shiva, of course, he is the incarnation or the personality of Brahman. So he has all powers. Then Shakti divides herself into three and becomes the consorts of these three basic demigods. And she gives them the powers to exercise their functions. That's how this creation works. But we can go beyond this creation. We can realize the Brahman. We can become one with the Brahman. In fact, we already are. And the proof is that we are aware of being aware. So next time we'll continue and keep going with this very interesting discussion on Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.